Hello and thanks for tuning in to Beach Woodcraft. Today we're going to attempt a one day project of a commemorative plaque for a customer in Vermont. The uh, customer is giving their employee a, a congratulatory plaque for their uh, exemplary service. So the base of the plaque will be made out of a dark walnut and the face of the plaque will be made out of white maple, which will later receive a laser engraving of a graphic and some verbiage. So thanks again for tuning in. This is Beach Woodcraft. I'm John and we're getting ready to get started. Our first step is in the milling process of this project is to obtain a true flat face on these boards. This is the face and we will run it through this machine called a jointer. After that, the next step is on the same machine and we will mill one edge of the board square to that face so that when we glue the pieces together, we can make a nice flat, as flat as possible, true and square panel. Uh, I believe what I'm going to do, and, and it, it, instead of boring you with this process because I've shown it at least a few times in previous videos, as have countless other woodworkers on YouTube, uh, but one change for me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark the face that I square with the jointer with a J. The upside of the J will be if that board, if that face was against the fence of the jointer. And that way when I align the boards, I'll know which way to arrange them. And secondly, on the opposite face that will be trimmed square with the table saw will be marked with a T for table saw. That way when I'm doing the assembly, I'll know which, which face was which, which uh, end was which, and uh, hopefully get the best panel that can possibly be obtained. So I'm not going to show a lot of video of this, like I said, because um, there's lots and lots of this kind of video to see. So I'll just show a pass or two and then we'll move on to the next step. Here's a close-up of unjointed side, jointed side. These, uh, this lumber was purchased from Woodworker Source. Uh, they're an online, I mean they have local stores in Arizona, none in Virginia, but uh, purchased online. It was um, pretty well milled to begin with, so that's why this was so quick. Uh, I, offline I'll go ahead and do the rest of the walnut and the maple. This operation is going to square up the opposite edge of our board. We've got the jointed face down on the table and our J which was marked for the jointed edge against the fence. That'll square our other edge to the first edge. I've also installed a premium blade to make these cuts as nice and smooth as possible. The last step in our initial milling process is to get the second face 
flat and parallel with our first face that we've already flattened. For that we use the planer and let's get started. I've got the project boards arranged in the way that I think looks the best, grain patterns matching as best as can be. Since I didn't get to pick these boards, we, they were ordered over the internet. Um, I'm going to use a glue called Tight Bond Extend. <clears throat> Tight Bond's the manufacturer. Extend, the, their Extend line uh, allows a longer working time. It does take longer to cure, but um, I never want to be in a hurry about that anyway. The, this project doesn't have any structural needs whatsoever, so I'm going to probably use a light amount of glue so that I don't have a whole lot of squeeze out cleanup to do um, uh, before we prep and finish the project. So here we go. I'm only going to put minimum pressure on these until I get the calls in place and you'll see what I mean by the calls. The calls are used to line up and keep some better alignment on the board's faces. While they're clamped together. Excellent. I meant to do that. Well, so much for going light on the glue. We've got quite a lot of dried squeeze out now that these are out of clamps. I'm going to attempt to use one of these hardened steel card scrapers that you create a burr on to clean up the blue, glue, the dried glue, and also to kind of blend in a little bit of the mismatch of the faces. And then uh, we'll see, after that's done, we'll see what we've got. This next step is to square the ends and cut out the project pieces to the right size. Uh, the base I'm going to cut out before we go and machine the pocket that the inlay will go in. Um, the inlay I'm going to leave whole, but I do want to square the ends. Um, that's going to get cut out. We're going to cut one rectangle and one oval. Over on, the CNC, over on the CNC machine. 
So right now I need to square the ends on this and get two 8 inch cross cuts off of this piece. I've changed out our blade. We had a premium rip blade in there, uh, 36 tooth. Now we have a uh, premium cross cut blade, 72 tooth. Uh, both the blades are made by Leitz in Germany, uh, resold by and made for Harvey um, woodworking machines um, and resold by them. So let's get these cuts done. Hello again. So uh, thanks again for uh, being here. This, uh, and the reason I'm saying that is because this one day build, uh, we're on day three. But um, you know, things come up, errands, grass needs to be cut. Uh, unfortunately, life goes on. So um, I, I don't think I have more than about two or three hours into this work so far. Um, I wanna cut the I'm going to make two of these plaques. I'm going to make one with an oval inlay and one with a rectangle inlay. So I want to cut the oval and the rectangle out of the maple here uh, on the CNC just to get more practice with the CNC, really. I know there's many other ways we could do it and we could, you know, talk about that ad nauseum. But um, so I've got this piece of maple double side taped down to the machine uh, and I've got it offset. This lip here in the front was cut by the, by the machine during the surfacing process. So that should be square to the, to the machine's travel direction. So I've got this uh, little fence here to bump our material out enough uh, to give me some starting room. And what I'm gonna do is um, uh, I used open builds uh, CNC control software and it has a nice feature that uh, does um, it draws an outline of the project part similar to what a laser engraver would do called framing on a laser engraver so it's kind of neat to have that as a double check and I'm so new at this that I I'm super cautious uh, about um, the cutting operation until I'm until I'm more comfortable so I'm going to get this all set up and I'll let you see a little bit of footage of the machine going back and forth. It's not super exciting, but it's pretty cool. So um, let me get this set up and we'll get going. Like I said, I just used this fence to give me an offset um, from the part to get it a little bit away from the front. And uh, we'll bring it up here. We'll do our probing and touch off. And we'll get started. Okay, so we did the probing X, Y, and Z axis. And you've probably seen that many times before. If you, if you really want to see me do it, let me know and I'll, I'll do it for you. Uh, now I'm going to demonstrate that feature that's similar to the framing, which to me it just adds a little bit of extra comfort zone, like at least I'm, I'm very sure the machine knows where the material is. Just like an extra, you know, like I said, I'm just so new to this that I want to make sure things go right. So let me show you that feature and then um, we're going to make some sawdust. Okay, and on this software, it's called check size. So as you can see, it doesn't look right. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not right. Huh. So apparently it's shy on the width and the length for some reason. And like I said, I, I do this because of this very reason. I'm not sure what that 
what that issue is, but I'll go and figure it out and then I'll, we'll come back and let you know what I found. Okay, and we're back. So my research showed that that feature, which they call check size, um, it only checks the size of the cutting area from the start position and frames the cutting area. It doesn't frame the whole stock piece. I thought it framed the whole stock piece, but it doesn't. So, uh, look, I think that framing was okay. But what I found out while I was doing that and checking a lot of other things just as a double check, I saw that the router bit I had installed had a flute length that was too short for this piece of material and since the shank of the bit was six millimeter and the cutting flutes were only five I was gonna have uh, I was gonna have some issues I'm gonna have either a lot of burning and or maybe a broken a broken a bit so uh, I had to swap out the bit I have to uh, reprobe everything anyway so I'm going to show you the probing operation it's pretty simple and easy you've probably seen it before but um, let me see if I can get this this out of the way so you can see better so we'll take a look at the probing operation I'll even bring you in for a close-up of the probing I have to bring you down. As you can see, I've got my probe on the table. And I have to line it up with the hole. That's the first step. Um, so lining it up, whoops, with the hole. I have to change the size of the bit because now I've got a quarter inch bit which of course I can never do conversion of inches to millimeters in my head because I just can't do that kind of stuff. So let's see if we can figure out what 0.25 is. Looks like it's six millimeters. Nope. Six point three five millimeters is 0.25 inches. All right, so you have to tell the probing software what size the bit is. 6.35. Custom probe. Save. Okay, we are going to probe. Going down for the Z, Z touch, good. Unfortunately, it moved the probe plate that time. But I caught it in time, so that was good. All right, probing complete. So we'll get that out of the way. I'm going to run the uh, check size one more time just for grins. And it's going over 8 inches, which is correct. And it's going down roughly 22, which is also correct. And then it's just coming back to its zero position, which is past the cut on this side, but going back to its zero position.
Okay. Everything zeroed to the work point. What we need to do now is get... I'm not going to run it without the dust boot on there because frankly I don't want that much dust. So uh, I'm going to have to raise it up and do that. Let's see if I can get it up high enough to get that back on. Alrighty. This isn't the boot that, this isn't the dust boot that came from uh, Bulkman. This is a Bulkman 3D machine. Theirs was metal and uh, kind of heavy. I really didn't like it, um, so I never tried it. I bought this one. I think I bought this in, on Amazon. Um, unfortunately, it's a little bit larger, so I lose more cutting area. But uh, I just like it better. So so far, that hasn't the cutting area thing hasn't been a problem. All right, I believe we're ready to go. We're going to get the um, get the coolant flowing, get the spindle ready to start up and we'll be ready to go. I've slowed this operation down because I'm just not good at, uh, at knowing feeds and speeds yet, but I've slowed it down considerably and um, hoping for the best. Put this back over here. I guess that may block your view a little bit, but uh, hopefully not too, too much. Oh, it's going to get noisy. Going to turn the dust collector on. And we'll start our operation. on the e-stop button because I am scared. Seems like a pretty deep cut to start. I don't remember making it quite that deep. I believe I can pause it. And I may do so just to check how deep it's going. I'm going to pause it right before it, it takes another cut. deeper than what I told it to do. That's a lot deeper. So I'm going to let it make that whole first cut 
but that's too much. Once it gets around to this, to the end of this oval that it's cutting, I'm going to pause it. You can see it shattering quite a bit. It's just going too deep. Too deep of a cut. Right, let's see if it comes. I think it's going to come up. All right, it's paused. I'll come back to you once I figure out what's going on here. Okay, so sometimes I uh, I trick myself. I don't know how or why with this with the between Fusion 360 and the uh, and then the 3D CAD part of it, then the CAM part of it, and then the machine controller, which I use the Open Builds controller. Um, The open build when, when you when you look at the G code, it's in whatever units you you did on your uh, Fusion 360 or whatever your CAD program is or a CAM program, and but but when you look at the position of the spindle and the height and all that, it's it's always in millimeters. So I got myself confused, but but any rate at any rate the the initial cut was way deeper than what I had asked for. I had asked for 0.14 inches and it went over 0.25 inches deep. And I never did figure out what that was. I regenerated the, um, the GRBL file and now it's going to the right depth, which is 3.56 millimeters is 0.14 inches, but it's just very aggravating going back and forth between units and all these other things that are going on and you, you lose track of, where did that screw come from? Interesting. You lose track of um, kind of where you are, but um, so I'm going to rerun this. The first cut isn't going to cut anything because we're already deeper than in the second cut may not cut either. I mean, we're already we're already deeper than that. So um, at any rate, um, and I'll speed it up for you, but uh, I want to I want to just get these things cut. I mean, it's it's time to just get them cut. It's uh, been here for hours now fiddling uh, with this and uh, I, I wish I had a more definitive answer of what fixed the depth issue because I don't. Um, the only thing I did do was in the height in the heights tab of the Fusion 360 cam I changed the bottom setting from stock bottom to material bottom and it doesn't even give you an explanation of what the difference is. To me, I think they're the same. But that sort of fixed it. So I guess I need to read more about that, but I'm kind of tired of reading about stuff. So um, I'm going to reposition the camera, turn on the dust collector, and we'll run this thing and, and get these pieces cut.
Okay, today's been a heck of a day. Um, as you can see, we've got our two shapes cut. Couple, several interesting things here. The oval cut through and left the tabs and perfectly didn't scratch the spoil board. The rectangle didn't cut through except for where we had that problem. And I'm going to tell you what that was and, and, and uh, you know, maybe, hopefully it would help you avoid such an issue. But first let me bring you in to show you what happened to the table. Because um, I think, you know, it's worth noting. I guess from the videos I've watched and the folks that I've, you know, followed, I guess everybody kind of does this at least once. And so you can see the bit drove through the board, through the spool board, and clipped about a sixteenth of an inch of my uh, T-track. Didn't seem to hurt the bit at all. The bit really um, still seems to be fine. In fact, I finished up the cuts with the same bit. And uh, it was just as happy as could be. So... After rerunning the job and watching it, what happened is it, it um, and if you look at the board, you see, it, it, we cut the oval first. And then when it made the transition from the oval to the rectangle, it was to, supposed to retract all the way above the surface of the, of the material, but it didn't. And what happened is it lost its Z steps. So it thought it was, you know, five point some millimeters above the height, up above the stock, and it, and it was not. So then when it tried to drive down, <laughs> obviously um, it was already quite a ways into the wood. And so this first cut right here that was a full depth cut, over three quarters of an inch and into the spool board a good ways, you know, over another, more than another quarter of an inch into the spool board. So what I, what I finally, when I finally realized after a lot of trial and error and watching it as it made the transition and not making it above the stock height is I finally realized that it was attempting to drive up out of the cut at the maximum rate that was set in the um, GRBL settings. And that's a setting that uh, you set in whatever software is operating the machine. Uh, and then what it does, when you save that, it writes that setting to the firmware uh, of the uh, controller, of the CNC controller. So um, that setting was 2,500 millimeters per minute, which was the same as the X and Y axis uh, maximum rate. And, uh, you know, watching other folks who had built this similar machine, they had set the X and Y to 3,000 And I, I don't recall what they set the Z to. I just don't recall. Um, but I, I thought they set it to 3,000 as well. And I could be wrong. But uh, what, I, what I wound up doing is I changed the Z maximum rate to 500 millimeters a minute, uh, which is still faster than I really want it to go anyway. So I, I don't think... It's never going to drive down at the maximum rate unless it's above the stock height. Um, it might often drive up in the Z direction at the maximum rate. I guess especially if it's, if it's attempting to fully retract. Sorry, double quotes. Uh, if it's attempting to fully retract. But um, at any rate, that fixed it. I mean... It, you know, it, it didn't lose steps, and so 
when it tried to drive to five point whatever millimeters above the stock height, it made it there. And so um, we were able to finish up the cut. And luckily, um, as the, as the, as, and you can see, as the, as the bit drove very, very deeply from here to here, it, I guess because of the grain of the wood or the, the way it was uh, cutting, it pushed the bit, the bit um, bent slightly in this direction. And since this is the piece I want, that kind of didn't ruin this piece, which was kind of just really luck of the draw. Um, seriously, only luck of the draw. Um, so now all I'm going to do is um, I'm going to take a pole saw and just cut these two pieces out and then um, probably wind up using a, um, a pattern bit on the router table to clean up those edges. Um, and then I'm also going to chamfer them and then I have to cut the negative into the, into the walnut so that these will fit. Uh, so that'll be the next step, but I spent too much time on this today and that'll have to be tomorrow. Okay, ladies and germs, uh, welcome back again. We are getting ready to cut the pocket in the base of this uh, plaque assembly so that the maple will fit into the walnut. Um, again, there's lots of ways we could have done this, but desiring more practice with the CNC machine, I'm going to do it this way. Now, I'm not going to hollow out the whole pocket. I'm going to cut the perimeter of the pocket and then I'm just going to use a router to hollow out the middle. I don't, I can't see putting the wear and tear on the CNC machine for that. Once I get my perimeter set, I should be very easily be able to stay inside of that, uh, that trench that I'm going to make. I'm going to make a trench 0.3 inches wide using a quarter inch 0.25 um, router bit. Got everything set, checked everything, don't expect any problems, but didn't expect any yesterday either. So here we go, we're on day four of the one day build. <laughs> yes, we can do it. Um, turn on dust collection, hit play. Here we go. Okay, so already we have a problem. <clears throat> it said the target exceeds the maximum machine dimension, which it doesn't. Um, but it says it does, so now the machine didn't move. The machine did not move, but the position indicated on the screen has changed. So this is the kind of crap that was happening yesterday. Um, I guess I'm going to rehome it and try again because I don't understand what's going on here. Um, so you're going to get to witness that.
that on there. Let's try. Okay. I say rehome, I meant reprobe. This this finds our stock origin. Um, not the machine origin. So the probe fell off, so we're going to try again. Okay. All right, so the thing's all screwed up. It doesn't want to do a damn thing. So we're going to have to re somehow, I don't know, lost its homing, I don't know what, we're going to have to rehome it and then re-zero it to the stock. I can't tell you how aggravating this is, I don't understand what is going on. And there's no point in you all watching this, we'll come back when this is all done. germs. Looks like we're finally, finally, finally ready to go. I'll explain what all the hubbub was uh, after the cut. final final few inches here it's going to take one more pass about two thirds of the way up on the uh, wide direction this way and then if I'm right I believe the machine homes but I guess we'll find out. Let's see what happens. Yep, looks like it's home. 
going to go kill the uh, kill the fan. So there's our there's our part milled out. And we requested a depth of 0.3 inches and a width of 0.3 inches. So let's see how well we did. You know, you can hold your hold your tongue funny in this will read weird, but uh, can you see it? 0 0.301. So 10 thousandths over. That's okay. I'm sure I won't be able to do that well with the router. And then at this spot, I've got 0 0.302. I'm good with that. Okay. So, explanation of what was going on with the machine. <clears throat> what was happening is the machine was being commanded to travel to Z0, so all the way up prior to commencing towards the plunge location. And what was happening was it was hitting the Z limit switch because this stock was so much thicker than this piece which we milled the other day. As you can see, much thicker. So what I wound up doing was um, pushing the, the, the bit quite a ways, since it, the bit was way longer than I needed, I pushed it quite a ways up further in and we were still touching the limit switch, but at least it, I think it wasn't quite activating it. So, at any rate, this groove is cut. It looks like it might be a little small. Well, no, it, it drops in there. It's dropping in. Okay, so obviously we'll have to square these corners with a chisel. I'm just going to use a chisel and come back with a router and clean all this out. And then we've got to put a chamfer all the way around here, chamfer all the way around here, and we'll laser engrave this prior to gluing it in. But uh, we're getting close. So for this operation, I have a brand new Woodpecker's two flute upcut spiral bit, one half inch. <clears throat> I'm going to use my handheld router to hollow out the rest of this middle. We'll also get a chance to see how well this um, dust collection adapter that's sold by Bosch for this particular router uh, will work. I've used it on the plunge base, but I've never used it on the fixed base, so we'll get a chance to see that <clears throat> and um, get this thing ready for assembly, laser engraving, and um, finishing. Well, I kind of wanted to use the fixed base uh, mainly just because I hadn't tested the dust extraction on that yet. Um, but uh, I wasn't able to set the router height high enough because this bit is so long. Uh, I only bought the long one. I didn't buy them. They have a couple of different shorter ones, but I didn't buy those. So um, at any rate, we're going to use the... Uh, 
plunge base and we're going to get started. Um, I'm using a, um, for dust extraction on this, I'm just using the shop vac with a, a dust deputy and um, the hose, this uh, Rockler uh, hose fitting fits perfect. So turn, turn the vacuum on and uh, see, how, see how well this goes. Okay, so this is going to be pretty unusual. I've got this base. It's made by M Power, and um, it's model number CRB7. And it has a lot of attachments and features, but right now I'm just going to use it to, for the support it provides. It does have a fence, which I was going to take off, but I kind of think that'll be nice to run it along here with. And normally, you would fasten some fasteners down here to hold this in a position, but I think that allowing me to move this back and forth will add some flexibility, although it's got a little bit of tippiness to it as well, so I'm not sure I'm not sure that's good or not. Um, hopefully as long as I kind of keep everything stable it'll be okay. Let me know if you think that's unsafe. Um, I kind of think if I'm careful, I'm okay. Um, so I'm going to try it. We'll see what happens. Okay, so a few observations. Um, first is I don't really like the loosey-goosey way this feels. It's a little disconcerting. It doesn't feel dangerous, it just doesn't feel great. Um, secondly, um, I was having trouble seeing where I was exactly, especially as I approached the my uh, my trench, my already cut trench. Um, I don't obviously don't want to overshoot and hit hit my clean edge. So I also noticed that because this is all loose, I'm not really getting an even uh, pattern here, which I guess is okay, um, but uh, it's not as nice as I thought it would be. Uh, at any rate, I'm not going to make you all watch all of this. I'm going to go ahead and finish it up and then we'll see it at the end. Well, the carve out is done. Um, I'm not super impressed overall with the dust collection. As you can see, there's dust all over the place all over the table, all over the floor, all over everywhere. I imagine there would have been a, an awful lot more, but um, at any rate, wasn't that great. Um, that's going to be enough for tonight. Then uh, our next step is to um, put a chamfer all the way around the edges of both pieces. Um, then laser engrave this, glue them together, and finish. So we're getting close.
Hello again. So here's where we're at. The um, the inlay fits this way pretty well. So by the long dimension, we have a good fit. Um, it does not fit this way. It's not off by much. I would guess about it almost, if I force it, I could get it in there. So I would say 20 thousandths of an inch. Now, since I already put the router away, I really don't want to drag it back out and it made such a mess last time. And I'm thinking, I'm going to just run the CNC machine manual. I'm just going to jog it across this line. Um, and the reason I'm doing the right side as opposed to the left side here, uh, see if I can help you see a little better. This side as opposed to this side is because when I measure it, this is a little bit thicker than this side. So that maybe that'll even it up a bit and it'll look a little more uniform and equal, at least. That's what I'm hoping. So what I'm planning on doing is jogging it to a starting point and checking it and then just running it down along this edge and taking off about 20 thousandths. That's all I really want to do. And then we'll do a test fit. Um, I'm not sure how tricky that's going to be, especially with the dust boot on there and I can't see and you know all that. But um, anyway, I'm going to try and jog it into position and see where I'm at. I've actually also already squared up these corners with my chisel and they came out really good. Um, I guess I'll have to re-square these two corners after we're done, but um, neither here nor there. Uh, okay, let's, uh, let's give this a shot and see where we're at. Okay, so I think I've mapped this silly thing out now. I know the full wide travel. I'm going to cut 20 thousandths off of this edge. And uh, it's just going to take a tiny bit of time and we'll try, try the fit again and see what happens. So here we go. Okay, so we cut 20 thousandths off. Let's see how we did. It looks good. I can see where the corners need to be squared up. Yeah, it's going to fit once I square the corners up. Okay. So that took care of that. Hello again. Uh, our next step is to put chamfers on 
these two pieces. I've already done this one. Um, I put a pretty small, maybe just barely over an eighth of an inch chamfer. You can see I got some burning on the end grain, but the uh, long grain didn't burn at all. So um, just got to be aware of that. The um, <clears throat> I'm using this sh shaper. I call it a router, but it's 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 really a shaper. The high the high, they only, it's only a two-speed unit, so the, the high speed is only 10,000 RPM, and I, I think that may be part of the reason why there's so much burning is just this bit is probably wanting to spin faster than this. Um, so a router table that could go 15, 18, 20,000 RPM is more appropriate for what's going on here, but it's getting the job done. I'm going to put quite a bit bigger chamfer on this one, so I'll run you through the process a little bit. Um, my first pass will just be the same removal rate as this one, and then I'll probably take two additional passes to get the, the amount of chamfer that I, that I want on this piece. So here we go. Oh, and... Um, I will do the end grain first because any chip out that happens at the end of the cut on the end grain will be cleaned up when we do the long grain. So remember that, always do the end grain first, do this side and this side first. Actually on this one, these are end grain. <laughs> the long edges are end grain uh, because this panel is glued together, as you can see it's glued together this way. So this is the, so we need to do our long edges first on this one. Good thing I've I discussed that with you. I probably would have done it wrong. Okay, so we need to do our long edges first. We're going to do three passes. And uh, let's get going. You don't really need a fence for this operation, but um, it makes me feel a bit safer. And uh, kind of also helps with the dust collection, kind of funnels that dust back in there better. Okay, let's take a look at that one. Nice, no burning at all. up a little. And I'm not going to make you watch all this. We'll come back and take a look at it when it's done. Here we are. I think it's a handsome looking piece. You know, it's going to be a a plaque given to a gentleman. It's very kind of masculine. Nice big chamfers here. Smaller chamfer on the centerpiece. And uh, the next step will be laser engraving, then a bunch of hand sanding, and glue, and finish. And we'll be all done. Oh, and I'm going to cut a keyhole in the back here, a keyhole slot so you can hang it on a picture hanger or a screw or a nail or something. So there we go, closer and closer.
Well, as many of us like to say, a project isn't finished until it's finished. So today we're putting on the finish and I've already wiped wiped it down with um, with naphtha to get rid of all the remaining or at least as much as we can the remaining um, sawdust or any other kind of dust that may have settled on it. And my concern, one of the concerns is that the laser engraving you know leaves behind soot and what I don't want is to get this soot uh, smeared. Um, so I'm not really sure exactly what I'm going to do. I think I'm going to try and drizzle um, my finish on there and for finish I'm using general finish armor seal which is kind of a satin finish um, but it gives a, a little bit of protection against um, moisture and dents and dings and things like that a little bit of protection this shouldn't need much my guess is it'll hang on somebody's wall somewhere for a long long time oh and the other thing we did off camera is with a keyhole router bit we uh, made this little hole uh, to use a screw or a picture hanger to hang it. So I've got everything mixed and I'm ready to just start applying the finish. I'm just really, really concerned about, about this um, soot getting spread around. So I think I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to drizzle. I'm going to see what happens as I drizzle. And to be honest, it's not, I don't want to get too much finish on this. So I think I'm not going to drizzle. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do. But we got to do something, so... Yeah, I can see it. I can see the soot sort of wanting to move around. So um, I guess what I'm going to do is dab. That seems to be the best. Maybe drizzle and dab. And for the second coat, once the soot is all dry, I can come back and then spread it better. Once the soot is, I guess, sealed in or whatever, however you want to say that, man, it's, yeah, I don't like the way this is going at all. So we're back to the drizzle. Back to the drizzle idea. And especially up here with the image, that's going to be very likely to run and so. I guess the other option would have been to use some sort of a spray application, which probably would have been safer. I'm just hoping that the wood is thirsty enough that it'll drink, drink enough of this up, because we certainly don't want globs. But I got to get it all coated. Okay.
Yeah, it probably it should have been sprayed. So lesson learned here, um, should have been sprayed. I'm just going to let it run over the top of the letters. Let everything get coated. I certainly can't brush it on. There's just no way it's going to smear all over the place. There we go. Okay, so everything there is coated. Except for maybe the year didn't get quite coated well enough. Spread and spread and spread. Trying to stay away from anywhere where the laser touched it, but get any buildup down. And what I may have to do is I may have to come back and lightly sand if I do have a little bit of buildup. So I have to just come back and lightly sand. And if that's what I have to do, that's what I have to do. Okay. Well, that was the hard part. The rest of it's just spreading it on. So we'll come back and take a look when it's all done.